Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Uh, this is going to be a makeup video for the high school Amazing Mechatronics, basically the Arduino Division C session. Uh, I apologize for the lateness of it. Uh, I was recorded yesterday, however, some technical difficulties prevented me from being able to render the video and upload it to YouTube. Spent most of the day trying to get it to work, which is why we're here now at 5.30 p.m. the day after recording it right now. Uh, this is going to be faster than the actual session was, uh, just because you at home will have the ability to pause and rewind at your leisure, utilizing the magic of recordings. So, well, I'm going to cover the same material that we covered on Tuesday. Uh, I will also go through it faster, and if you need to go over anything again, or if you need a little bit of time, of course, feel free to pause or rewind. So, last Thursday, we got an Arduino making a light blink. And that was, that was it. It was, you know, it was our hello world. We got it working and uh, it was, it was interesting to see how the hardware and the software interacted with one another. But that was basically the whole point of that, was to see uh, what was required of both interfaces in order to get them to, uh, to uh, create a complete circuit. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're actually going to up the ante and work with multiple LEDs because, of course, uh, one wasn't enough. We have to do eight. With that in mind, though, I do want to spend some time reviewing what we went over on Thursday uh, just so you guys can help solidify that information in your mind. Uh, so for that reason, I, when I go over this stuff, I, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. I encourage you to at least pause it after I ask a question because there is going to be a short review, uh, just so you can try and answer the question on your own. Otherwise, you know, you're more than welcome to continue uh, through the video at your own pace. So, a little bit of review. These green objects, these green things, are called, called LEDs. And what does the longer leg of an LED do? The longer leg connects to the positive, allowing for the current to flow through and ultimately allows for the LED to light up. Because remember, LEDs are uh, have a polarity to them. They have a specific way that they're supposed to be oriented relative to the rest of the circuit. So in this case, the longer leg connects to the positive end. Also, a uh, tip for those of you at home who are running with YouTube and maybe not aware of this, uh, YouTube has some keyboard commands uh, built into it. You can always hit K to pause the video, J to rewind it 10 seconds, and L to skip forward 10 seconds. Uh, and you just need focus on the window. You don't necessarily need focus on the YouTube app itself. Uh, I know I used to hit spacebar in order to pause it and use the arrow keys, but if you don't have focus on the actual YouTube uh, embedded video itself, uh, you will not be able to control it, and instead you'll go down the page and everything will get all messed up. So yeah, you can use J, K, and L in order to navigate a YouTube video. <coughs> K to pause and K to unpause. Anyway, uh, that was a nice little aside. I just thought that might be handy to know. So this was, well, this is an example of how an LED can be hooked up to a circuit. As you can see, the longer leg, the positive one, is referred to as the anode, and the shorter leg, or the negative one, is referred to as the cathode, which is a little bit backwards from how anodes and cathodes are generally thought of. Uh, however, uh, it makes sense in this situation because... Um, you're going to have, basically, the movement of electrons determines electricity, and electrons have a negative charge. So if you've got electrons moving out of the cathode, it is going to be more negatively charged. Uh, because, of course, as we all know, opposites attract and like re likes repel when we're talking about electricity and magnetism. So we're, we're thinking about how those electrons are being repelled away from the cathode and attracted into the anode in order for electricity to flow. So the anode naturally would be positively charged. Now these are called, and this is just an illustration, keep in mind. Well, these are called resistors. What do resistors do? Well, like I was harping on uh, all last Thursday, uh, they used to limit voltage and current. Uh, essentially, they turn electrical energy into heat energy and uh, reduce the amount of electrical energy, flow electrical energy flowing through a system. Now, why are these necessary when we connect LEDs? 
well as you might remember, too much power going through an LED will cause it to fail. You'll often cause damage to the LED. In dramatic cases, you might cause the LED to pop, which is fun, but it means a broken LED in the end. So, you know, that won't work anymore. And in pretty, you know, in very um, extreme situations, sometimes that can also mean fire, which is bad. So we're trying to avoid those things generally if we want to have a working circuit and not just trying to create, you know, a fireworks show on a circuit board. So we use resistors in order to limit the amount of electricity going through that circuit. They allow us to control the current flow so that LEDs receive an appropriate amount of power, as it says there on the slide. So try to see if you can identify the following things. Um, think about what 1 is, what C is, what A and B and D are. I don't know why. Uh, I think that 1 is a little bit is extra. It's not meant to be there, but it's kept here in the subsequent slide, so I, you know, I'll ask it anyway. Let's take a moment to think about that, and then I'll just go over what all five of these are. Okay, so one is the barrel plug for power, um, providing 7 to 15 volts to the Arduino. Now, A are the power pins. Uh, as you can see, the Arduino can send out 3.3 send out or 5 volts. Uh, it also has a ground for completing any circuits. And there's also a voltage in, um, just in case you need it. Uh, there's also an I.O. reference uh, pin as well, but we don't really worry about that. And then a reset one that if you send a, if you send a circuit or a, a signal down, it will cause the Arduino to reset. Uh, B are the analog GPIO pins. Now it's referred to as analog in because some of these digital pins over here on the right hand side can send out a mock analog signal. Uh, it's called pulse width modulation. Uh, we'll go over that later on. You don't really have to worry about that right now, but. Uh, by virtue of the fact that the digital, some of the digital pins can send out a mock analog signal, uh, we tend to reserve these analog pins over here on the left-hand side for in only, because of these, these are the only pins that can read an analog signal, which can be very useful. So for that reason, analog in. Now we've got C up there, which is the AT mega chip, which is kind of like the brain of the Arduino. And then we've got D over here on the right-hand side, which are all of our digital GPIO pins, um, numbered from 0 to 13. And then we also have some additional uh, pins up here for just uh, specific purposes. Now, I should also say that 0 and 1 can be reserved for sending and receiving data along the Arduino as well. So for that reason, we tend to start with 2 when we're using the GPIO uh, pins for circuits and run up to 13. So just so you know. Okay, so, now coding review. What are these, and what are the difference between them? If you have any experience of programming in C or Java, you will be very familiar with these, I'm sure. Well, they denote comments. Uh, comments are simply notes for yourself in the code that the computer does not see. The double forward slash is a single line comment. Uh, anything using the single line comment uh, escape will be a comment as long as it's on the same line. As soon as you go to another line, though, it is no longer part of that comment because it's meant only for a single line. However, the forward slash and asterisk combo is for a multi-line comment, and that will run as long as you'd like until you write the basically the ending escape characters, which is an asterisk and a forward slash, so the same thing but in reverse. You can think of it like two bookends. Um, now, that's great for if you want to write some more information about what, you know, like a, maybe a function is going to do or something like that. You want some more uh, documentation on a particular part of your code. The single line comment is great for just quick notes and things like that, because it doesn't take up a whole lot of room and it's very easy to create. The multi-line comment is great for more extensive documentation, because you want to make sure that you give the appropriate amount of documentation to everything in your code not only for yourself, but certainly for yourself, but also for others. What about these right here? What are they called? What are they, what are they, what are they, or what are they used for? It took me a second to get that uh, sentence out of my mouth. So these brackets are referred to as curly brackets, or curly braces, or 
wiggly brackets, although that's generally not the, you know, as professional sounding as curly brackets is, uh, people generally don't use wiggly braces, but, you know, sometimes it's kind of fun to call it that. Uh, but they denote the beginning and end of blocks of code that are contained within either functions or loops or if statements or something like that. Uh, much like if you've ever used Python before, how you have to indent in order to denote that some code is a part of a function. Uh, with Arduino and with Java and with C, you use curly brackets instead in order to denote that. So as you can see right here in the example, uh, void loop has the curly brackets. And then there's a comment in here, and this comment is part of void loop because it's within of it's within void loops curly brackets. Now we're going to create a variable. So in this particular small little test, we want to create a variable named LED pin that stores the number twelve. So how would we do that? And I'm going to go through this step by step. But of course, take a few minutes for yourself to think about how that's done, what the syntax is, and how that works. Okay, thought about it? Well, first off, we would start with the type of variable, because the Arduino language is a strongly typed language. That is to say, uh, the variable type we have to establish in the beginning in this case, we'd have to establish that it is an integer variable since it's holding the whole number 12. And it will not change based on, you know, the input that we put in, unlike uh, Python, in which case you can just declare it as a variable and Python will try and guess what type of variable that's supposed to be based on the information you feed into it. And that can become mutable, changeable. Uh, you can you can put in different information and change what it the, the type of variable that it is. In this case, we declare it an integer variable, and it will stay an integer variable. It will, in fact, freak out if we try to feed it something other than integers. Depending upon the compiler, it'll probably try and do its best to convert it to an integer. Uh, but most of the time, they'll just say, hey, that's not a valid thing you can put in there. I have no idea how to, you know, handle uh, you feeding the letter C into an integer variable. So in this case, we need to declare the fact that it is an integer variable with the INT uh, keyword. <coughs> Excuse me. After that, we wanted to call it LED pin, right? So we should probably put in the name of the variable. In this case, it's going to be LED pin. So, so far, we've declared that there is going to be an integer variable called LED pin. Then we wanted to store the, the number 12 in it. So we should probably say, hey, it's equal to 12. And what that does is that sets LED pin equal to 12, which is exactly what we want. So now we have an integer variable called LED pin that's holding the number 12. However, we're not quite done yet. We're missing one more thing. And this is actually a very big part of syntax for Arduino code. And if you're familiar, again, with Java or C, you're familiar with this bit of syntax. And that is the semicolon. The semicolon is like the period at the end of the sentence. It tells that the line of code is complete. You know, we have to use that every single time we're writing a single you know, line of code in Arduino programming language. There are certain exceptions to that, but then Again, those can be thought of as something other than just a simple line of code. So it's a good, it's a good uh, sort of axiom to, to um, hold yourself by when you're writing code in the Arduino programming language. Put a semicolon at the end. So as a quick summary of all the syntax, we've got a semicolon, which ends a line of code. We've got the curly brackets, which are code containers for functions. We've got the double forward slash, which is a single line comment, and the forward slash asterisk and then the ending escape asterisk forward slash, which denotes a multi-line comment. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a similar version of the blinking light um, <coughs> circuit that we just did earlier, um, except we're going to use eight LEDs. And why eight LEDs, you might ask? Isn't this the same thing but bigger? Well, I'll tell you. That's because... On the hardware side, it's simply a matter of expanding what we've done before. However, this does change some things on the software side, so it allows me to introduce some new coding concepts to you, or some perhaps familiar coding concepts and how to do them in the Arduino programming language, that you can then utilize for anything you're, you, know, you have to do in either the, uh, the Amazing Mechatronics competition or for the Arduino later on, whenever you're curious. So, 
Uh, this is in fact for the single LED, and as we all know, this was a pretty simple thing. You just, you know, hook up the ground, hook up the resistor to the grounds. I'm pointing at the screen, that doesn't really mean anything, so let, let me use the cursor. Hook up the resistor to the ground, the LED to the resistor, and then the LED to uh, pin 13 on the Arduino. And that will, that allowed us to write some code in that controlled uh, when the Arduino sent power out on pin 13. All pretty straightforward stuff. Except, oh, and l let me go over the code too. We, uh, this was also pretty straightforward. We created a variable holding the pin number. This is not a, you know, uh, redundancy. This is actually holding the number of the pin, uh, in this case 13. And then we set the uh, the pin mode, which was, uh, which is a command that tells the Arduino um, whether or not to set a pin to be input or output. In this case, we set pin 13 to be an output pin. And then, in our void loop, we turned the pin on, waited a second, then turned the pin off, and waited a second. This was all pretty easy stuff. Um, at least, you know, once you, once you understood what, you know, the syntax was for, it's pretty easy to dissect what this program is supposed to do. Uh, also notice, of course, we've got single-line comments galore. That could have been a multi-line comment if you were so inclined. However, these do have to be single-line comments. Well, or there are multi-line comments that terminate on the same line. Anyway. So we'll skip over the two LEDs bit, and we'll go straight to eight LEDs. Because eight is better than two anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to circuits.io, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new electronics lab. Because Lord knows... I certainly don't have enough already. Of course, the moment was ruined by the fact that, there we go, see, there's just tons and 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 they're not all fully loaded, but there's, there's a whole bunch of them. You'll just have to take my word for it. So we're going to do a new electronics lab. You can, you can also create a new one that way. And once it's done loading, eventually, we'll be looking at a single breadboard. And that's it. So perfect. So far, so good. So let me go ahead and click on this breadboard to select it and hit R a couple of times in order to rotate it so that we have it running vertical because that's what we want to do right now. And then I can just click and drag in order to pan the screen and put it in full focus. Next, I'm going to go up here to the components window and I'm going to drag out a resistor, an LED, and our Arduino. Now, you'll probably notice that I only pulled out one resistor and one LED, even though I've been crowing about the fact that we're going to be using eight resistors and eight LEDs. Eight resistors because each resistor, you know, each LED is going to have its own resistor. Um, however, I'm only dragging out one. And there's a very good reason for that. First of all, we want to, just like our single uh, LED circuit, we want our resistor to be 330 ohms because we've already established that that's going to be the proper amount of resistance in order to have the LED light up enough so that we can see it. But, you know, it's also going to slow down the current enough in the circuit that the LED won't, in fact, pop. So let's go ahead and if we click on the resistor, we'll get this, you know, context menu up here. And we're going to use that to change this to be 330 ohms. Bam, like so. So now we know it's 330 ohms because we got the two orange bands and the one brown band. Um, reading that would, you know, we, we'd get the idea that it's a 330 ohm resistor. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift and left click and drag. And that creates a box. I can box select, bo box select both of these. And then hit control C on my keyboard. Didn't really seem to do anything, right? But if I hit control V, I get another set of resistor and LED on my cursor, and it follows my cursor. So all I have to do is click once in order to place it. Bam, done. And let me place six more pairs. So now we've got eight resistors and eight LEDs, and the reason why I did the one first is because it copied the resistor value. If I copied it before I changed the resistor value, I would have eight 1,000 ohm resistors, and I would have to change each one of them individually, and that would just be kind of annoying. 
So in doing this, I've created eight 330 ohm resistors, which is exactly what I wanted. Also note that you can change the color of the LED. That's strictly for just like a, you know, flavor kind of point of view. I'm going to go ahead and do that just because why not? But you are by no means required to do that. I'm going to have two yellow, two orange, two green, and two red LEDs. And done. So, we've got our components ready. We've got our Arduino ready. We've got our breadboard ready. Let's go ahead and start hooking everything up. So you remember how I said that the anode was going to be the positive leg on the, uh, the LED? That's the side we want connected to these digital write pins on the LED. Or excuse me, GPIO, digital GPIO pins on the LED. They're digital write pins for this program because we're going to set them up to write. Um, <coughs> the cathode is going to be the short leg on the LED, and that's the one that we want to hook up to the resistor. So let's go ahead and start setting up the circuit in such a way that we can easily do that. And all I'm doing right now is I'm just hooking them up sideways so that there's a little bit of space. In fact, one row of space in between each LED. And this will allow me to ensure, as you can see, they're all falling on rows that line up with this minus rail here. Um, that will allow me to ensure that I have, you know, uh, a place to put the resistors for each of these LEDs. Space them one row apart, one row apart, one row apart, and I just set them up in a nice little pattern here. Completely superfluous, but, you know, I like things to be visually appealing, so there we go. And then I'm going to hook up these resistors to whoop, the cathodes on the LED. So let me go ahead and just boom. And you can always mouse over the pins on the LED in order to confirm which one is which. Hook these up to each of the cathodes, blah, blah, blah. Also, feel free to skip this part if this is boring you and you already know what to do because this is just me hooking stuff up to a breadboard. Boom. There. We've got all of our resistors hooked up to the cathodes on each LED, which is exactly what we want. Next, we need to set up our ground rail because these are all hooked up to the minus rail, right? And the minus rail is going to be what's hooked up to the ground on our Arduino. This is necessary so that we have a complete circuit, as you well know. So let me go ahead and draw a wire over to the ground rail. And uh, in case you forget, I'm just clicking the open space in order to generate a bend in the wire. Just left clicking, you don't have to do anything crazy, but you can create some pretty loopy wires by doing that. Anyway, I hate escape to cancel that. So now, by virtue of the fact that we hooked this minus rail up to the ground on the Arduino, we've already hooked up the cathode on these LEDs and the resistors up to the ground on the Arduino. Pretty handy, right? So now we need to hook these up individually to uh, each to their own pin on the Arduino so we can control them. So for instance, I'm going to hook up this bottom one to pin 2 on the Arduino. And again, just in case you've forgotten, the reason why I'm using pin 2 instead of pin 0 is because those can be reserved for data transmission on the Arduino. So I'm going to keep them uh, starting at pin 2. So we're just transmitting nothing but electricity. So let me go ahead and hook this one up as well. And actually, we can probably, yeah, that's going to be a very very gentle bend there. And I'm color coding them just purely for personal preference. This is this is solely an aesthetic thing. This is by no means required in any way. But keep in mind I am hooking them up so they are on subsequent pins. We have a nice conga line of pins being hooked up to um, LEDs on the on the breadboard. this, do 
do this. And we'll make this one yellow again to keep along with our coloring scheme. This one is going to be orange. And finally, this one is going to be red. Now, normally red would denote a hot wire, so we'd use like a red for our, each of these. But given that, you know, they're all going to be hot wires going out, uh, I'm just keeping them color coded, so it's, it's pretty easy to keep track of uh, which one is hooked up to which. And in doing so, we've actually completed the hardware side of this. Like I said, very simple. It's just replicating what we did once, but seven more times. So this is the exact same process to hook up a single LED like we did for our pin 13 blinking LED. However, we just added seven more LEDs and, and seven more pins to plug into. So now we're running from pin 2 to pin 9 to power the LEDs, and we've got one for the ground hooked up to all of the resistors. Now we should uh, focus on the software side of things. So let me go ahead and get the uh, Arduino program open again. Give it a second to open up. Excuse me, there we go. We'll wait for it to pop up down here. Bam. So, if you'll remember when we did uh, the, so the software side of things before, we created a variable that held the pin number in it. We can do the same thing here, except just multiple ones. So let me go ahead and do this. Now, any of you who've had experience with programming will probably notice that there is a highly, there, there is a big inefficiency in what I'm doing here. And you might know a better way. But, you know, work with me here. I'm doing this for the sake of people who maybe have not seen these concepts before. Uh, if you already know, you can skip ahead. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to apologize. I um, forgot about the two most important things in any Arduino program, which are the void setup and void loop functions. Those always need to be there, otherwise your Arduino will not run. You need these two. You need them, you need them, you need them, and you need to put at least something into them so that something will run when the Arduino is running. Void setup can be empty. You don't need anything in void setup, but void loop needs at least one thing in it so that the Arduino can do something. Um, technically, you could leave them both empty, but your Arduino would do nothing. It would upload properly, but absolutely nothing would happen when you turned it on. Because if you remember, whenever we run an Arduino's program, these things are necessary. The Arduino looks for these two things, and it's going to run void setup once, exactly once, when it first boots up, and it's going to run void loop an infinite number of times over and 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 over again until you either restart it or cut the power. And even when you restart it, it's just going to basically clear out the memory, run void setup once, and then run through void loop again, just like it was doing before. So that's how it operates. So that's why you'd want to have something in void loop in order for your Arduino to do something. Almost ran out of breath there. Anyway, um, let me go ahead and do the same thing I did here. So except we're going to do pin mode, LED pin 1. Output, pin mode, LED pin 2, output, so on and so forth. I'm going to use copy and paste my old friends in order to... Oh, extra one. In order to set up the pin mode for each of the pins on the Arduino. And then we can do, uh, you know... Digital right, LED pin one, high, delay 1000, digital right, LED pin one, low, delay 1000, and so on and so forth. And 
this, I mean, there's a problem with this code, as you probably have already guessed. Freaking huge. Like, look at all this stuff. I mean, I've got, like, a really big font, too, but still, this is 56 lines of code. That's big. Imagine if you had, like, a million LEDs. I mean, hyperbole, but you could probably, you could possibly have, like, a hundred LEDs. And having to keep track of all of these... I mean, copy and paste is nice, but now I have to go through and I have to say, oh, LED pin 2, LED pin 2, LED pin 3, LED pin th oh, 3, see, there you go. That could happen, too, where you could have, like, oh, LED pin 3, LED pin 3, so now I've got I've got this set up twice. Oh, jeez, come on, cooperate. I got this set up twice, and now our LEDs are going to look funny when they go, because LED 3 is going to blink twice, and then it's going to skip 4 and move on to 5. Or it's going to blink three twice, and then it's going to go four, five, six, seven, and eight's never going to happen. You're going to be like, why isn't eight working? So for this reason, we're going to utilize, we're going to take advantage of, we're going to leverage two concepts in coding, which will make your life in this kind of situation a lot easier, and those are arrays and loops. Uh, we'll get as far as arrays before the end of this video, and I will sort of show the structure of loops, but... I will get m in more in depth in explaining loops this coming Thursday, which I guess is tomorrow. Um, so I just want to basically go over the concept of both of these real quick. Uh, arrays are um, lists of numbers, essentially. Uh, that's not exactly the proper terminology because, confusingly, there are in many programming languages also lists which are separate from arrays. But insofar as thinking about how you can, well, insofar as explaining about how you can think about arrays, you can think of them like lists of numbers. I'm sure all of you are familiar with lists in general. I mean, grocery lists, um, Christmas lists, uh, in, you know, uh, class lists, you know, student lists, whatever. Lists are pretty prevalent in everybody's life. They're just a collection of things all on one single piece of paper. Um, listing all of the elements of that so you can have you know a grocery list and then you can have all of the things on the grocery list so you can have milk and eggs and you know bread and, and butter and and f you know chicken or whatever um but the entire point of that is so you have all of those elements in one single place obviously it's so you know what it's a reminder so that you can buy all the stuff that you need at the grocery store but regardless um that's the reason why a list exists. It'd be kind of annoying if you had to keep track of like multiple pieces of paper that all had a single item on them. You're just like, oh, okay, like I think I went through everything, uh, but unbeknownst to you, you dropped the one piece of paper, the one scrap of paper that said the word chicken on it back over in aisle five, and so now you've forgotten the, the chicken. You can think of these single variables as single items written on a scrap of paper. So, in that sense, you might just have something that's got, you know, five written on it. And this is your whole variable. Except, it's actually part, it could actually be part of a larger whole. So what if we put that in there? But we also had one, six, nine, four, three, eight, uh, seven all on this list if we put that in there oops so now this is part of that piece of paper assume that uh, this is my this is my terrible paint job i apologize um <coughs> but now this is all part of the same piece of paper now also important to note the fact that they're all they're all collected together now um, and we can reference either this entire piece of paper which you can think of like the array or the individual things on it like the elements in an array so that's essentially what arrays are is they're lists of things I know I'm not explaining this perfectly right now and I apologize for that but by using arrays you'll also get much more familiar with them um, Arrays allow us to keep 
whole sets of numbers or names or, or values of some sort all in one place so that we can reference them quickly and um, change them quickly and organize them as we need to and all kinds of things like that. Uh, arrays are very powerful, you know, uh, constructs in programming. Um, and, perhaps most importantly, they'll help trim down your code pretty significantly. So, for example, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn all of these variables into one single array. So, let me do that. And bam, just like that, we now have an array called LED pins that stores all of the pins that these LEDs are hooked up to, just like so. But that's not even the best thing you can do with arrays. The best thing you can do with arrays, well, one of the best things, one of the, one of the uh, directly related to this, is you can leverage the power of loops in order to iterate through those arrays, basically go through all of the values and do something with all of them. Um, and that's actually more or less where we left off on Tuesday, was saying that we could do that with loops. Um, so Thursday I'll spend time explaining what loops are and what we can do with those. But hopefully this gives you sort of a taste of how much we can reduce um, the amount of code that we've typed here. In fact, we can actually do a whole lot towards automating our um, using loops in order to, to, to make it a lot easier to, to go through all of the lights on the Arduino. On top of that, we can have some fun with loops so that we can have patterns lighting up the lights on the Arduino and stuff like that too. But as it stands right now, uh, this is pretty much where we were on Tuesday. Um, again, I apologize, my thoughts get a little muddled on explaining arrays, but uh, that will hopefully make more sense, again, with use. Um, if you guys are already familiar with loops and things like that, I would encourage you to experiment with uh, arrays and loops in order to get this thing to light up how you would like it to. At least all in order at first, and then later on you can do crazier stuff. Um, but as it stands right now, that's pretty much going to do it for this lesson. Uh, we'll meet up again on Thursday and start off with loops. I'll explain loops. We'll run through loops. We'll see how loops can affect arrays and things like that. And then we will continue with more Arduino. So good luck, everyone. Um, have a great couple of days, I guess. Have a good life. I don't know when you're watching this. It could be 300 years in the future, although... You know, probably not, but have a good life if that's the case. Um, hopefully this will be my legacy to the future uh, <laughs> as a relic of the past. Um, but yes, we will see you all on Thursday.